Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. How great the vain of searing the Father turns His face away As wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to glory And behold Upon his shoulders, in a shame, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was a His dying breath has brought me life, and I know that it is boast I will not boast in anything no gifts no power no wisdom but I will boast in Jesus Christ his death and resurrection and why should Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. But this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Amen. If I should come forward this time. Would you pray with me this morning? Father God, we are just so thankful, God, to be in your presence this morning. God, we praise you. God, we praise you this morning, God, for the convictions that we have. God, we praise you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. God, we praise you for the cross. We praise you, God, for sending your one and only son to die upon that cross. Live. And so, Father, we praise your name this morning, God. I pray that you would bless the gift and the giver of this offering. God, I pray that you, uh, that you uh, allow us to dig into your word, but God, not just be hearers of the word, but go out and be doers of the word as well. God, as I often pray every Sunday, empty us of us and fill us with you. It's in Jesus' name. And everybody said, thank you. May be seated. So over the next several weeks, we are going to be looking forward to Resurrection Sunday. Uh, And so we're going to take a step away from our series through the book of Mark, and we're going to spend some time in Scripture uh, looking at 
different stories of resurrection throughout the Bible. Uh, and that's what we're going to focus on this morning and then again every Sunday leading up to our celebration of Jesus' resurrection on Resurrection Sunday. So excited about what is to come. As we look at these stories of resurrection, we see God's ultimate power over death and indeed all things. How many gardeners do we have in the house this morning? Anybody with a green thumb? You know, one thing about gardening that I kind of understand, but I kind of don't, it's one of those things like I know what happens, but I don't, it still kind of blows my mind a little bit that it happens. Kind of like flight. I've talked about that before, how you get in a plane that huge, I understand some of the properties behind it, but actually seeing a 747 take off into the air is still something that blows my mind a little bit. So another thing that blows my mind a little bit is when it comes to horticulture or uh, uh, gardening, uh, and that is composting. It doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, if you've ever composted or you've seen compost, compost is essentially waste, right? All sorts of wasteful materials or wasted materials put together to decay. Somebody who has a composting bin, that's something you don't want to open and smell, something you don't want in your home, or if you have it in your home, you want to make sure that it's put together in such a way that the smell doesn't leak out, because compost is gross. Yet, whenever you put that compost into your soil, it produces more rich and vibrant life. It's the whole circle of life thing, right? It doesn't seem like that would happen. It doesn't seem like, again, you wonder, like, who are the first people to figure this out? Who is the first people to think to themselves, if I just took a bunch of decayed leaves and other organic material, which is a word they wouldn't have used back then, but if I take a bunch of this together and I'll let it slowly decay, and then after keeping it that way for a few months, I don't know how long you compost, I put it into the ground, put it on the stuff that I'm going to eat someday, that that's going to make sense and make things produce well. It's interesting how God created our world where death gives way to life, almost as if he was trying to teach us something. We see that in this season, in the spring. We see plants that were dormant becoming alive again. And many of those plants, those annual plants that fall asleep or, pretend, or seem to die where the leaves fall off every winter and then come back in the spring, it is the dying process that allows the seeds that they've germinated while they were alive to fall off, fall into the ground, and then once again germinate to create new plants and new life. And again, is this cycle in life that God seems to have created perhaps to teach us something. Because from the human perspective, death seems to be that great, unconquerable enemy. And humanity has, for as long as it has existed, asked the question, how do we overcome this enemy? How do we beat death? Can we get past it? And we have seen long working hours from people in medicine, from people in philosophy, from people in all sorts of science, trying to figure out how to delay death, how to prolong life, and could we avoid death altogether? Even going into the realms of mythology where people would look throughout the, 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 the United States when it was newly colonized, trying to find the fountain of youth, the answer to stop death. It is the thing that humanity has searched for for as long as it has existed. But we know through the testimony of Scripture, we know through what we're about to read and what we're about to celebrate in a few weeks that God establishes power over death. And what we're going to see this morning is that God establishes power over death by gaining victory through death. In the context of the passage that we're about to read in 2 Kings chapter 4, starting in verse 31, we're going to read about a man named Elisha. Elisha is the successor of the great prophet Elijah, and really close together, we can often get them confused. And so if I say Elijah by accident today, forgive me, I am talking about Elisha. Elisha is the key prophet in this story. And in this story, he is passing through a land named Shunem when he is seen by a wealthy woman who notices that he's a prophet of God and decides that she wants to feed him. She brings him in, her and her husband feed him. And then after they figure out that Elisha is going to be coming this way often, her and her husband decide they're going to build a house or a room, I should say, on top of their house so that the prophet Elisha can stay with them while he's in the area, which he does. Now, with the help of his servant, a servant named Gehazi, Elisha tries to come up with a way to thank this Shunammite woman. And the way that he comes up with to thank her is to go to her, 
because she doesn't have any children and her husband is old. He goes to her and prophesies that she's going to have a child this time next year. So in about a year, she's going to have a child. They kind of laugh at it at first, but she does indeed, her and her husband, even in his older age, do indeed bear a child a year later. When the child is old enough to work, he goes out with his father into the fields and one day begins to complain of a severe pain in his head. His father sends him with one of his servants back to his mom to care for him, and underneath his mom's care, the boy dies. The Shunammite woman takes the boy's body up to the room that they had built for Elijah, lays it on, I did it already, room they had built for Elisha, lays the boy on Elisha's bed, doesn't tell anyone else, and makes quick haste to get to Elisha because she believes that he could do something about it. She even avoids telling the truth to her husband. She avoids telling the truth to Elisha's servant, Gehazi, when she finally gets to Mount Carmel where Elisha is. She makes quick haste to him, and then when she finally gets to Elisha, she drops the facade and she wraps herself around his legs and begins to tell him, essentially, why did you make this prophecy if you're just going to take him from me? Why did you allow this to happen? Elisha then gives his staff to his servant Gehazi and sends Gehazi back to the Shunammite woman's house to see to the child. And that's where we pick up in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 31 through 37. If you're able, would you please stand in honor of God's word? Gehazi went on ahead and laid the staff on the face of the child, but there was no sound or sign of life. Therefore, he returned to meet him and told him, the child is not awakened. And when Elisha came into the house, he saw the child lying dead on his bed. So he went in and shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. Then he went up and lay on the child, putting his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, and his hands on his hands. And as he stretched himself upon him, the flesh of the child became warm. Then he got up again and walked once back and forth in the house and went up and stretched himself upon him. The child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes. Then he summoned Gehazi and said, call this Shunammite. So he called her and when she came to him, he said, pick up your son. She came and fell at his feet, bowing to the ground. Then she picked up her son and went out. This is God's word. You may be seated. God establishes power over death by gaining victory through death. And the first thing we see in this passage, however, is that we are powerless against death on our own, in our humanity. There's nothing that this Shunammite woman nor Elisha's servant Gehazi could do to bring the boy back to life. Gehazi takes the staff that Elisha had given him and strangely, to our eyes at least, lays the staff upon the boy might be wondering why that was to happen. Think back to the Old Testament. Think back in particular to the story of Exodus, to Moses' staff, to the powerful things that he did with the staff. It was thought back then by many that a staff could carry the power of a person. And so by lying the staff on the boy's face, maybe Gehazi thought that he would, through the power of Elisha, be able to bring healing to this boy, but nothing happens. And again, the woman herself was unable to do anything to bring healing. By the time in verse 32 that Elisha finally makes it to the boy's side, he has likely been dead for some time. They are seemingly powerless to do anything to reverse the situation. I don't know if any of you have ever experienced, like truly experienced, a dangerous storm. I mean a literal dangerous storm. And when I say truly experienced, I don't mean like you watched it on the Weather Channel or National Geographic. I mean like you were in it, in it, in it, where you were stuck out in a field somewhere or you were in your car on the interstate as this great hailstorm came through, or you were on the coast when a hurricane was coming in and you got to experience that. Imagine yourself there. Imagine yourself Again, on the coast, watching the storm surge come in, watching the wind and the waves rise, the lightning fire off in the distance as a hurricane approaches. 
Imagine yourself on the plains of West Texas as you see a tornado descend from the sky, tearing up neighbors' fields and barns, coming your direction, and you don't know what to do about it. Imagine yourself, if you've ever been in that situation where you're out and you're stranded, maybe you're camping or something like that, and suddenly a freak, we've been in this situation before, a freak storm comes out of nowhere, and there's hail and there's lightning, and you hide in the only shelter you can find. Imagine yourself in that situation. And all you have, all you have to protect yourself in that situation is an umbrella. And not just any umbrella. I'm talking about one of those umbrellas that comes from your kid's toy closet, right? I'm talking about one of those umbrellas that has like Paw Patrol on it or Caillou. If it had Caillou on it, you know it has to be weak. Can I get an amen from all the parents that have had to endure Caillou on PBS? You, you get one of those and, and, and that's all you have. That's all you have, right? It, it, it's a comical view, isn't it? To think of that's the only thing I have to protect me. There's no way that this little umbrella is going to protect me. You would feel powerless in such a situation because there's nothing that you can do in that situation to protect yourself other than just to hope everything goes by just fine. That's how we often feel in the face of death and that's how all of humanity is in the face of death without God. Hopeless and helpless. We are seemingly, through our own human eyes, we are powerless against death. And we need to recognize that. We need to recognize that death cannot be conquered nor avoided with our own power. We're coming up in April, and you know with April comes taxes, and you know that one of the truisms or cliches about life that many of you have probably heard from a young age is that there are two things in the world you can count on, death and taxes. We know that those things happen that there's no avoiding them. Paul, the apostle, recognized this reality in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 26, when he said that the final enemy to be defeated is death. We have in the advent of the modern world, in the advent of modern medicine, we have the seemingly like detached theory in our mind that through the ingenuity and the innovation of mankind that we can somehow eventually avoid death. We have medicine that can prolong the days of life, maybe even prolong the quality of life, but not even modern medicine in all of its innovation can avoid death completely. We recognized that very acutely as a globe four years ago during the COVID crisis, recognizing that there are some things in our world that we still are not prepared for, that we still are surprised when they come our direction. Death cannot be conquered with human power. But aren't we grateful that we don't just rely on human power? Aren't we grateful that it wasn't just up to Gehazi and his staff? No, Elisha was coming with the power of God. Because immediately when Elisha enters his room with the boy dead on the bed, the first thing he does is what? He prays to God, knowing that God alone has the power. God defeats death through death. And we see that in this particular story. As Elisha undergoes what looks like a very strange behavior, he lays himself out prone over the boy. It's strange, but it's not the first time it's happened in Scripture. You can find Elijah, Elisha's predecessor, do this in 1 Kings 17, in case you're wondering. But it still seems strange, even if it's the second time it's been done. Why in the world would they do this? There's some scholars that believe that there was a belief in the, in the ancient world that you could have a transference of power, a transference of power from one being to another by that close contact with each other. Some believed that would happen. And sometimes it was even flipped on its head a little bit, meaning that like, from an evil perspective, one could steal the power of another in the same way. We certainly don't see that here. There's also maybe the idea that Elisha is breathing life into the boy, much like God breathed life into the dirt in the days of creation to bring the man Adam to life. And so maybe there's some of that going on. But what I think we see most acutely in this behavior of Elisha and Elijah before him is them identifying with the dead child. Elisha, by laying prone over the child, joins him on the deathbed, eye to eye, hand to hand, face to face, becoming like him in his death. 
The child warms up at first, signifying a gradual return to life. And then after Elisha gets up, walks around a little bit, and comes down and does the same thing again, we see the boy sneeze seven times. I don't know why sneezing is the thing that they choose to use, but seven is always important in Scripture for recognizing a fullness. And so it represents a full return of life to this child. He is fully alive, fully healed once again. Elisha joins the boy on his deathbed in a way that prefigures what Christ does for all of us by literally becoming death so that we might defeat death. By literally dying on the cross so that death might then be powerless to us instead of us being powerless to death. Death then, in our mind, we know that it has no real victory and that it is not to be feared because God joins us in that death. If you've ever been in weightlifting, I'm going to try to get the whole gamut of human experience this morning. Talked about gardening. Now let's talk about weightlifting, okay? If you're not a gardener, maybe you've lifted some weights. If you've lifted some weights in the day, when I say lifted weights, I mean free weights. I'm not on a machine that, you know, where you put the pin in, but free weights. If you've ever done that, you know the essential nature of a spotter, right? Especially if you're maxing out or you're going to exhaustion. Uh, we did that some when I was in school where you would lift until you couldn't lift anymore. And it wasn't your job to put the bar back on the rack. It was the spotter's job because you were supposed to go until you couldn't move anymore. And you'd be super sore the next day. And that idea of a spotter is not someone who just watches. Right? Spotter, the word, the connotation is that it's just someone who spots, who just looks. Right? I'm just looking to make sure there's not a problem. I have my hand. If somebody's doing bench press, I have my hands underneath the bar. But I'm not helping. I'm just spotting. But eventually, a good spotter has to become a teammate, right? Because eventually, if the weight gets on your chest and you can't get it off, a bad spotter would be someone who just says, oh no, I've spotted that you're about to die. No, a good spotter would be, okay, I'm going to lift this off of your chest and help you get it back on the rack. I'm going to join you in lifting that burden that you yourself are unable to lift. Jesus is not just some spotter who sits by and watches us endure pain. No, he, through joining us in our flesh, gets in our pain, gets in our dirtiness, is tempted in every way that we are, yet without sin, even to the point of death, he humbles himself, and he lifts the weight that we cannot lift. He joins us in the effort that we cannot give enough of to make sure that death is fully conquered, and he does it through death. God echoes this reality in creation all the time. I've already alluded to it, about how death gives way to life. Through death, God brings life. God defeats death through death, and we worship that God. We worship the God who died to defeat death, just as the Shunammite woman does with Elisha. Elisha, recognizing that the boy is fine, brings the Shunammite woman back in and says, take your son. She comes and she falls at his feet, bowing, an obvious act of gratitude and worship. No words are spoken by the woman or at least recorded by the author of Kings. Instead, we get to see by her actions that her relief is clear and full. She picks the boy up and she walks out. God, through Elisha, did for her what could not be done by any other means. And we worship the God who descends into death to identify with us and to defeat death for us. We worship the one who defeated death through death. If you're into hospital dramas on television or in the movies, think like ER, house, stuff like that, or even the good old soap operas that come on in the middle of the day, uh, if you're into any of those, you know that one trope that runs throughout those is the last minute organ donation savior. You know what I'm talking about, right? Where there's a patient that they need a kidney, they need a lung, they need a heart. They need some other weird thing because it's sweeps weeks for the TV and they're trying to do something that, no, that nobody else has ever done even though everybody else has already done it. And suddenly something happens, right? And usually this is the way it plays out. You find out that they're sick, 
Suddenly, even though this process normally takes longer, suddenly you figure out, they only have 30 minutes to an hour, by the way, so they got to do it quickly. Suddenly you figure out that they need this organ transplant or they're going to die. You put their name on a list, but they're well down the list. And there's people above them on the list usually that are like rich and ungrateful, uh, you know, people that you want to antagonize and not like. You don't want them to be on the list. You want the other person to be saved. Uh, and so you're going through all this emotional drama. And then at the very end, what happens? Oh, I have this long lost cousin who just happens to be a perfect blood match to be able to give me that kidney. It's a miracle. He actually has a third kidney and he can give me that. So I'm just playing, it doesn't happen. But that's kind of the, 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 the story that goes on or it seems fantastical, right? I've always, I've said to you before that I believe some of the, 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 the best hooks in modern film and literature are ripping off the Bible. Because the Bible tells us the greatest story, the greatest true story that's ever been told. That God came and sacrificed himself through Jesus Christ for all of us. And every time we see sacrifice in movies and it tugs at our heartstrings, it is that story that is tugging at our heartstrings. Not William Wallace, not the character of the movie. It is the story that is imprinted in all of our hearts of a God through Jesus who came to rescue us. At just the right moment, Paul would say in his letters, when the fullness of time came, God sent his son Jesus to die on our behalf. In that last possible moment, to rescue us when nothing else would do. Is this God not worth worship? Is this God not worth praising? This God who defeats what we cannot? This God who is bigger and stronger than death? This God who cannot be conquered and nothing can stop? Not even the ultimate and final enemy of death itself. He is worthy to be praised. And that is what we celebrate during the season we call Easter. We celebrate a God who cannot be defeated by death. So much power does God have over death that he utilizes death as the medium through which he defeats death. God establishes power over death by gaining victory through death. We are powerless against death. God defeats death through death, and we worship him in response. Now, as we come to a close, I want you all to join me in a little bit of 1980s Christian pop culture nostalgia. Who's up for some of that? Anybody remember? Anybody remember the 80s? I'm 40 years old. I know that there's maybe some of you who don't. Uh, at this point, but maybe you remember the 80s. In the 80s, there was a Christian musician, and that word needs to be used loosely because he talked his way through most of his songs, but a Christian musician by the name of Carmen. Anybody remember Carmen? Carmen's the man, right? Some of you remember Carmen. Maybe you've seen him in concert. If you saw him in concert, you know he, put, he knew how to put on a good show. Carmen used lights. He used drama. He used dancers. Uh, he was way too white to be trying to pull off the dances that he did, but he tried really hard. He was this character that that was just a little bit larger than life. And we got to see that happen. And one of the songs that I remember the most that Carmen used to do was actually on an album by the same name, and that is the song, The Champion. Does anybody remember The Champion? Okay, The Champion is this song where basically, again, Carmen talks his way through the entire song. And I want you to go back and look, okay? I want you to enjoy this nostalgia. And if you missed it, I'm sorry. You missed a core moment of Christian culture if you missed this song. What I want you to do is I want you to go to Spotify. I want you to go to iTunes. It's not iTunes anymore. Apple Music, whatever. Uh, go to YouTube and find the 1987 version of Carmen's The Champion. Don't get the 2017 remastered version because they take some of the goofy 80s stuff out of it and it ruins it totally, okay? So the way that this song starts is there's this strumming of what sounds like a sitar, like a, a Middle Eastern guitar kind of thing. And then there's this weird, low kind of vibe synthesizer pad that comes in and Cartman, Cartman, <laughs> not Cartman, wrong thing, Corey. All right, Carmen uh, decides to begin telling this story and he tells the story of this great cosmic fight this great cosmic battle between Jesus and Satan. 
And Jesus and Satan are showing up in the, somewhere in the cosmos, and there's this great fight that they're going to have. Later on, by the way, Carmen made a movie about a fighter. He played the fighter. It worked out pretty well for him, I guess. And anyway, so they're setting up this great fight. God is the, both the announcer and the referee of the fight, is setting the rules for how things are going to go. And then he introduces, finishes up introducing the idea by saying they're going to fight to see who is the champion. And then, like any, eight, like any good 80s song, the synthesizer beat drops. You know what I'm talking about, right? You begin to hear those, those wonderful synth sounds of the 80s. And in case you're wondering, what in the world is this guy talking about? If you've seen the music montages of Rocky Three or Rocky Four, you know exactly what I'm talking about. When Clubber Lang or Rocky, Avan Drago and Rocky are getting ready, they're getting prepared, and you have that pop-up music going on in the background, that's exactly what this sounds like. Go listen. You're going to agree with me, I promise. And so all of that synthesizer music gets pumped up and gets going. You have the story of the fight played out. Satan keeps trying to hit Jesus, but guess what? Jesus dodges every strike. He's not going back because Jesus isn't that way. You know, he's not going to fight back yet because he has a plan. And so eventually they fight for, get this, 40 days and 40 nights in the cosmos. They fight, and then finally, to fulfill prophecy, Jesus for one moment lets his guard down, and Satan hits him with what I'm assuming is a right hook and knocks him to the ground dead. All of a sudden, the music slows again. And Carmen, in his deep voice, talks about God turning his head because Jesus is dead. Satan thinks that he is one. The minions of Satan are beginning to, to squill with delight. Car Carmen even manages to voice those characters as well throughout the song. And then Satan breaks out in a sweat. Because what's supposed to happen when you knock one, someone down in a fight? Supposed to have the 10 count, right? One, two, three. And when you get to 10, it's over. The fight is over. But Satan begins to break into a sweat because God begins the countdown, not at one, but at 10. He begins counting down. 10, 9, 8. And you can hear Satan in the background saying, what are you doing, God? That's not the way this should work. Or is you're doing it backwards. Why are you doing this? Suddenly I can see him moving. Where's this light coming from? And then he gets down, five, four, three, two. And you can hear Carmen in this big, booming voice. He has won. And Jesus rises from the mat. He alone is victorious. And when Satan thought he was going to lose, suddenly he wins. And I know you're thinking, man, that's some goody, goofy 80s stuff. But even Though I know that it seems kind of cheesy, there is still something that when I listen to this in preparation, I know this is hard work, right, listening to that in preparation for the sermon. When I listen to that in preparation for the sermon, there were still goosebumps on the back of my neck because it tells a story, no matter how cheesily it is portrayed by modern media, it tells a story that is true at its core, that it looks like from all perspectives, from the human perspective and from the perspective of the evil one, that Jesus has been defeated, that death has won, that death has its sting, that death has its victory. And just at the moment when it seems like death would finally win, what happens? The empty grave is empty. The tomb cracks open. Light pours out. And Jesus is not dead. In fact, he's more alive than he has ever been. And he will live forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. That's where his resurrection is different than anyone else's. He was resurrected to never die again. And in that, we see the victory of God through Jesus Christ. The victory of the resurrection. That even death is turned backwards by our God who can use it to bring us life. So when we feel hopeless, in our world against the very real specter of death and against the metaphorical reality of death in all of our lives. Death of dreams, death of relationships, death of careers, death of youth, all of those things that we experience. When we experience the hopelessness of humanity's face against death, may we be reminded that there is no such thing as hopelessness when you follow a resurrected and a resurrecting God. God is in the business of bringing life into dead places. This is an awesome truth, y'all. 
that I cannot convey just by telling you about a Carmen song. In the midst of death, God brings victory. He gets down dirty. He comes one with us in death. And then he brings life. It doesn't make any earthly sense. But it makes perfect sense in the economy of heaven. So may we be a people who hold fast to the power of life, no matter how bleak the power of death becomes in our world. Because we can look around and we can misread the room and we can see this bit of bad news and we can see this conflict and we can see this heartbreak and we can see all of these things and it looks as if death is reigning supreme. Let us not see through that lens. Let us instead see that death has had its moment. It will have its moment, but by the grace of God, death always, for those who follow God, always gives way to life. So where are you experiencing death this morning? In what area of your life do you need to be reminded that though dreams may die, though relationships may die, though hope may seem to have died, though you may be experiencing loss and disaster, conflict, division at some point in your life, where do you need to be reminded that the resurrection power extends into that part of your life too? That the gospel is not just for the baptistry, that it's for all of life. May we remember that and may we walk in that and realize that the power of Jesus' resurrection applies to every single thing that we do. God does not want us to walk around as zombies, as dead people who talk about being alive. No, he wants us to live in the fullness of who he is. And who he is is a resurrecting and resurrected God. Where do you need a reminder in your life like that today? During our time of invitation, in just a moment, I would encourage you to invite God into that, to ask God to breathe fresh life into that area of your life, and commit to following him, to believing that he can do it, and to pressing in in that area, to not giving up hope, but moving on to what you know that he has called you to do and be. And also, if there's anyone here today who has not experienced that life in Christ for the first time, I want to tell you that Jesus died so that you may live. He came so that you don't have to taste death, that your body may pass, but your soul will be forever sealed with him. He made that a reality. And if you choose to accept his resurrection power, if you choose to proclaim that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved for eternity, and you will begin to experience that salvation even in life today as God resurrects the dead parts of your life. If you need to pray about that or anything else this morning, I'm here to do that with you. If you want to accept Christ for the first time, I'm here to do that with you. I'll hang around after the service as well, but I'll be down here as we sing our last song. Would you please stand? I'm going to pray. Ethan is going to sing. You're going to sing with him. And as he does, would you respond however God calls Father, again, once, once again, we thank you so much for this morning, God. We thank you for who you are. God, we thank you for being here with us and in us through your Holy Spirit. God, we thank you in a world full of reasons to doubt, full of reasons to want to give up, full of death and decay and destruction. God, we thank you that even through this broken world, you are not only will bring life, but you are bringing life today. God, I pray that you would bring life into the dead places in our lives. God, that anyone here who is carrying that weight today, God, that they would lay it at your throne. God, that they would seek your life over it and your power over it. And God, we know that you will deliver. God, give us the faith to believe and the courage to pursue. And God, those in this room who do not know you, God, may you through your spirit, God, may you give them the grace to respond. May you convict their hearts that they need to make a decision to follow you so that they might experience life not only for eternity but here today in you. God, may you make the dead alive as you always do. In Jesus' name, amen.